Hi, this is Eric from Longbox Review at longboxreview.wordpress.com. Uh, today, we, I have a very special guest with me. Uh, we're going to talk some comics and some other things, uh, but let's let's get right, get right to it. Uh, with me today is the master of the mic, the prince of podcasts, the man, the myth, the legend, Mr. Peter Rios. Hey, Eric. How are you? Master of the mic. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm good. Thank you, Peter. How are you doing? I'm doing good on this uh, nice, cool Sunday, Sunday morning. Or afternoon. What is it? Oh, no, it's morning for you. It's afternoon it's, for me. That's, that's correct. We're on opposite ends of the country. That's right. I'm thank, in the future. <laughs> that's right. You're in the future. Uh, <laughs> thank you so much for, for agreeing to come on to my, my little podcast. I, I so much appreciate it. Hey, sure. No, thank you for the opportunity to uh, play, in your, play in your podcast sandbox. <laughs> Uh, it, it's, uh, I, 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 I'll tell you what, Peter, when, when you put that call out on, on Twitter, you know, it, you know, basically does, is anybody want me on, on the, on their podcast? I'm like, are you kidding me? Um, <laughs> I, <laughs> how, so, des- how, how desperate am I? I'm like, please, <laughs> somebody, somebody, anybody want to talk to me? Hello? Are you, no, are you kidding me? I, I thought for sure. So, you know, I, I actually debated about this, Peter, because I have to admit, um, you're, you are, uh, a large part of why I started doing, um, my own podcast, you, you and the comic geek speak guys, you know, cause I, I started listening to, uh, the CGS show and, uh, thought, you know what, I, I can do that too in my own little way. And, mm-hmm. and I, you know, I, I like to talk about comics and I want to get a conversation going, you know, you know, albeit, you know, I throw something out there and maybe someone's go, uh, listening to it and going, you idiot. But, um, but that's something. <laughs> Uh, so I was a little, uh, you know, I have to say a little intimidated, uh, uh, by that possibility and, and, so, but I sent it anyway and you graciously agreed. So again, I, I want to thank you for that. No, no. Like, like I said, thank you. I, I love, the thing I love about podcasting is it really is the great equalizer, you know, everybody, uh, who, who, because it does take some initiative, right? It's, it's not easy as I'm sure you've come to know after, you know, 20 some episodes, it's, it's not an easy venture, no, um, not at all. You know, and even though you can do it by yourself uh, or with, you know, Skype or co-host or something like that, there's still some time that that is involved and, and some patience. And, you know, if you stick with it long enough, it, it starts to become a groove. And then, you know, soon enough, it'll start to invade and, and you'll just have to do it because you, you, you love it so much, you know. Right. And yeah, <clears throat> excuse me. And uh yeah, it, it, everything that you've said is, is exactly true. And I, I, like I said, I'm, I'm only, uh, this will be episode 28 when it goes out. You know, I, I'm only that many episodes in. I can't even imagine how I could pull off what you were doing with the CGS guys uh, <laughs> on a weekly basis, let alone, because I mean, you were doing um, the, the Titans uh, mm-hmm. podcast as well the, the, as the crisis thing with Murd. Mm-hmm. I I, I I don't know how you how many how many hours in a day do you actually have, Peter? <laughs> like I said, I'm in the future, so I can <laughs> jump back and forth. Uh, I think a lot of it is is um, even before I started the podcast, way 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 back in the in the AOL days uh, when they used to have uh, AOL homepages and all that. Um, whenever I read comics, I used, I just I just always either take notes or write up a real quick thing and I would post it on my old AOL page um, or I would just have it on a piece of paper and I just have like a folder of notes and I have a, um, a timeline of comics history, a personal timeline of books I've purchased, you know. So all of this was always sort of, you know, in my brain, some kind of focus, you know, comics. It, it, I never knew what I really wanted to do with it. I'm not even sure I really even wanted to do anything with it. I just did it. And the same sort of uh approach happened in the podcast right you know i would read something i'd take notes i'd make a note of it maybe that would make a good future episode maybe we would get to it maybe not um so going back to that whole commitment thing to the to to a podcast i mean it was really there strongly for me and uh, i think that's one of the reasons why i was able to do as much as i i did on on cgs uh just because you know sometimes there's a lot of stuff you want to talk about Right, and and so that that's kind of the, the challenge I face all the time is all this and, and and comics, you know, every week there's something going on, mm-hmm. and uh, it's it's finding the time, 
you know, cause, cause I have, I have a family, my usual co-host Travis, you know, he has a family, uh, and you know, all, you know, just our regular day jobs, you know, we, we can only have, we, do, we can only devote so much time to doing this, this thing that we love to talk about. Um, so yeah, I, it, it's, it's hard to find the time to do it, uh, on my end anyway. And, and then two, yeah, I'm worried about what you, what you just said about, you know, um, if you, if you do it long enough, it might become a grind and, and then you have to do it and maybe it's not as fresh and, and as enjoyable. Um, I haven't quite reached that point because there's just so much going on. Um, but, but I do worry about it. So, uh, it's nice to have, uh, I'm starting to get some new people. I, the last episode I had another old friend that, uh, came on the show and we, we did a review of the Avengers movie. And now nice. this week I have you on. So this is nice. awesome. Yeah. Good. Yeah. And that that whole, you know, thing about it getting in inside you, it's, it's I, I actually look at that as a good thing. You know, it's it's it, you you almost want to do it. Uh, so you that means you'll find the time as opposed to the many, many, many podcasts that have pod faded. Um, obviously, there 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 wasn't something in them that wanted to keep it going, you know. Mm -hmm. So I think that's a good thing. You know, if you love the medium enough and uh, of podcasting and you have people who are around you who are supportive and, and you can get them to talk. And that's really, you know, that, that's, that's your through line that that'll keep you going in a, in a good way, in a healthy way. Um, if it, if it becomes homework, uh, in the negative sense, then yeah, you know, then, you know, just find the things that you don't like about it and, and just don't do that anymore. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's what mm -hmm. I, that's what I think. Yeah. Well, and, and part of that for me is, is I'm still finding out what those things are. Yeah. So, so yeah, it's 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 uh, a bit daunting at times, and mostly it's just it's a it's a wonderful adventure that I that I'm discovering each and every time good. I do this. So, great. It's it's still new enough for me. So it's 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 good. Yeah, and you you you're gonna you know I always look at it as you you were surprised when I said I went back to uh, the beginning of your podcast to listen to those early episodes, but I think every everybody has to start somewhere and and after you know i don't know half a year a year 10 episodes 25 episodes whatever it takes uh it should always constantly grow and change and and um so it stays fresh for you you know when it when it starts to get too formulaic too early some of the fun goes out of it i think mm -hmm. um but uh i think i think uh, even though you're still in the early stages you know you have a good amount of time underneath and uh it'll still it'll still grow and, and be the, the, the show you want it to be. Exactly. Yes. Yeah. And, and, and with everything that's going on in the comic industry, I mean, there's, there's really, there's, there's no limit to things to talk about, you know, not, not just to, not just to mention the, the, the stuff that's going on within the comic titles themselves. Uh, but within the industry right now, it's just, mm -hmm. it's just crazy. All this news and, and everything that's happening and, and what's coming next there's always a topic. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> always, always something to talk. About. Yeah. Uh, well, speaking of something to talk about, Peter, what have you been up to lately? Uh, lately summers are usually slow for me. Um, they're the theater scene around Philly is usually slow during, during the summer. Um, I wrapped up obviously, uh, my first year at, uh, the university that I teach at, although we're, we have some faculty meetings this summer, and then the production company that I'm with, we are, uh, we just wrapped up, wrapped up a production and we're having meetings about what to do next and things that we're working on next. And, uh, so it's a very sort of transitional, uh, transitional period and, and which is kind of good. It's, it gets a little creative, uh, gives me time to do some other things I want to do. It gives me a little bit too much downtime. So I, I get a little bored, but here and there, um, but uh, I fill it with watching TV and catching up on old TV series, uh, catching up on some books maybe that I haven't read, some comics I haven't read. Uh, and then I went and did the silly thing and, and got a girlfriend. So <laughs> now I'm spending time with her. <laughs> yeah, I actually have uh, been enjoying your, um, your, your little tweets about uh, what, you, what you've been doing recently. And, and it, it, mostly it's just – it's nice to hear that, you know, that, that someone that, that you, you, 
you, you, you know, we don't know each other personally. We, we, we've met briefly at a con, um, and this is the first time we've actually talked beyond a few minutes. But, but you know, I, I feel like I know you in it to a certain degree, Peter, because I've been listening to the CGS show for so long. And, you know, sure. I read your posts and all that stuff. So it's kind of that, that weird you know, I, I think I kind of know you, but I really don't type of thing. But but it's but it's nice to see that, you know, that you're you're enjoying your time with someone new like that. So, yeah. Yeah. And, I you know, I put it out there. I certainly it's not like I don't put myself out there. Um, <laughs> and, and part of it is just I don't know why it is. I mean, I guess it's because I've always done I've always been that way. And uh, I even told her uh, her name is Aaron. I said, uh, you know, I, I may be say things about you is that okay and <laughs> just you know take a picture and put it on instagram or you know something on twitter we just saw brave the other night you know and i so i mean it's just i don't know we i i like that i like that sort of the the, the openness that some of these social media sites provide and 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 i just i don't treat it so seriously you know i just try to have fun and be silly and because uh, there are people out there that um there, I mean, there are also a lot of people that I do know very well, you know, that are that the only way we talk is through Facebook and Twitter. Um, and and that's cool because that's that's sort of how we keep up with each other. It's the reason why I love to listen to podcasts, because I get to sort of catch up with people that I know, you know, and and uh, uh, sort of see where they are right now. I'm listening. I'm doing a a, um, a big catch up with uh, Derek Coward's comic book noise. I don't know if you n- listen to that. I have. Yes. Yeah. And. That podcast, like yours, uh, at times, I, I like to listen to because they're single voice podcasts or or they're a voice with a guest or something like that. Mm-hmm. And uh, and that sort of intrigues me, you know, the whole single voice podcast thing. And uh, so I'm catching up with Derek and I'm at a point in his podcast, uh, a bunch of pod, I'm, I'm behind in his show, too. But he was going through a period where he was unemployed. Now he has a job like where I'm listening. He actually got, he has a job now again. He, he got a new job. So it's kind of cool to sort of hear his life and, and, and to see that it's going in a good direction. And um, and I've never met Derek, never met Derek face to face yet, uh, although we've talked online and, and through podcasting. So, mm, so okay. that's that's kind of why I, I enjoy all of those platforms and why I'm I'm OK with throwing out a lot of my life on there. Yeah. Do you think, uh, since you mentioned your, your theater work, because I'm I'm immensely uh, intrigued by that, uh, most mm-hmm. mostly because I actually did dabble in in uh, high school theater oh, cool. uh, many many years ago, <laughs> and uh, and and now my daughter who is attending college um, is pursuing a um, a theater arts. I'm sorry, no, a musical theater degree uh, nice. from the university here in Idaho. Um, so you know I. I the stuff that I did, like I said, back in high school, you know, that, that was no big deal. But it got, you know, it got me interested in theater and I started going to shows. And, and now with my daughter doing what she's doing, we, we've seen quite a few um, the, the, the traveling Broadway shows that they bring around the country. Right. So mm-hmm. we go to those and enjoy them immensely. Um, and so, what you know, when, you know, I, during the course of CGS and, and your online presence, you know, I, I, I found out that, you you know, you do theater work. I know, like you said, you mentioned you're, you're, you're uh, teaching at a u- university. Mm-hmm. Yes. Um, and uh, tap is your is your dance, right? Absolutely. OK. Absolutely. Yeah. So all that stuff. Um, so do you think that that maybe uh, your involvement in theater is, is, is related to your kind of openness online? Oh yeah, absolutely. I think it's one of the reasons why uh, on the on the on CGS I sort of became the not only the producer but sort of like the point man for a lot of the episodes um, because of that. I, you know, I've never taken a how to speak in front of people class or any of that kind of stuff. You know, I just sort of I guess it just kind of came naturally. Um, and. Uh, some of the theater stuff that uh, that I can see kind of crossing over into podcasting is, you know, I've directed a few shows and and sort of um, I've taken a lot of script analysis classes. I've taken a lot of book courses where you do a lot of discussions on books and and talking about themes and author intent and uh, you know what to look for in a book, in a script, in a novel, in a play, in a musical. Uh, yes, yeah, so all of that stuff certainly. I don't think I ever called on it um, intentionally. It just, after a while, I started to realize, oh, 
okay, I'm putting a lot of my theater education and background and experience into this podcasting thing. So it definitely crosses over and it definitely helps. And it, and it is a big reason why I guess I, I, I sort of keep myself out there. And was it, uh, correct me if I'm wrong. Um, this is my interpretation of, of, of events. So when you when you took a, a hiatus from the show or you left the show, the CGS show, mm-hmm. what, it was to to uh, focus more on on your theater work, wasn't it? Uh, it actually was. Um, the production company I, w- I was with uh, brought me on, sort of, uh, I, not really full time, but for lack of a better phrase, brought me on for more stuff. And I was getting really busy. And since I lived in Philly and the show is in, recorded in Reading, PA. Uh, I would have to go back and forth on the weekends or just phone in. And it was starting to be uh, just a little too much. It was, you know, at that time I was doing that and then got the uh, UR, the university gig. So my time suddenly was was just getting less and less that I was able to just kind of, you know, slip it back to, to Reading. Because I would go down to Reading and maybe go down on a Saturday we re- we would record Sunday and Monday. Uh, I would hang out with my parents, you know, during all that time. I'm, I would go back to Philly maybe Tuesday, sometimes Wednesday, you know, and that's that's a long chunk of time. Yeah. Uh, and then I would go back to Philly, and sometimes I I would go right back to Reading again the following weekend, or I would just stick in Philly and hang on the phone for the podcast. So it was just getting to be too much. Uh, I needed to pull away. From the show, it was, uh, uh, you know, like we said earlier, it was just at a point where I was like, no, this is getting to be too much and, and for me to handle uh, the show of this magnitude. And I, I said, you know what, I think I need to go uh, and just uh, step away from it all. And I'm actually, I'm glad I did because uh, job offers popped up, things popped up. Um, and uh, it, it just felt really good at that time to do that because I was focusing on other stuff, like, like you said, theater. So Mm -hmm. it was good. It was, it was, it was a well needed, uh, well needed, needed break. Um, because I love theater and I, you know, it's what I do and it's awesome that your daughter's doing it because it's a, it's a passion and, and, and a industry that is not easy on the people that want to do it, you know? (laughs) Yes. Yes. Um, (laughs) You know, I I think my daughter and I both kind of know that, in yeah. you know, in general, just based on you know life and experience and other people involved. Um, but she hasn't really, you know, she's still within that safety net of school. Right. And uh, but although that's coming to an end within you know two to three years, and then she you know her plan is to go off. Um, right now, her plan is to either go to uh, the West Coast to L.A. or to go to your side of the country uh, in New York. Mm-hmm. Um, so, which of course, um, her dad is not very keen on, but I understand. (laughs) Uh, and, and when I, go ahead, no, no, go ahead. Well, well, I was gonna say when, when, um, when I mentioned, uh, to my family that I was going to be talking to you and, and of course they, you know, uh, they know about you too, because I've talked about you, um, uh, in the past. Uh, but what they didn't know or what my daughter didn't know was, you know, how much you were involved in theater. And so I was explaining her, explaining, explaining that to her a few days ago. And, uh, and I know off the cuff, I just said, is there anything you want me to ask Peter? And, uh, and she's like, yes. How do you get a SAG card? <laughs> <laughs> and I don't, I don't know if you have one. I assume you do, but. No, uh, I'm not sorry. Not SAG. I'm not, I'm sorry. Equity. Not SAG. Uh, equity. Yes. Equity. Okay, I was just going to say, SAG is uh, for TV and film, yes, and, and I'm, I'm showing SAG my ignorance there. Yeah. No, no, no. That's that's quite all right. Most people don't even know about equity, much less SAG, you know, or any of those. Uh, equity, uh, for those people who don't know, uh, the Actors Equity Union is the union of actors um, for theater and uh, uh, anybody in the theater business. It's sort of like the professional union, and it's a way to um, Ensure that that you get uh, you know certain I don't want to call them perks but certain things like uh, uh, you know healthcare if you if if it's provided and um, you get weeks towards insurance and and all these things and uh, you get a higher pay because you're working well not always always but you're working for union jobs and it un- and it means that you're just covered with someone in case you know there's a bad contract or a 
bad director or whatever. Um, and uh, for for younger theater people that maybe aren't in a big city or near a big theater community, it's sometimes better not to be equity right out of the gate because oh. you you know there are there are professional jobs that hire for non-equity. I mean, there's certainly tours that hire for non-equity tours around the country. Um, they're a little bit more strenuous in the sense that on a on a non-equity tour of a of a show and it could be a show off of broadway right you know it, it could go out on tour as an equity show but then you know a year or two later it could go out as a non-equity tour with another production company um you still get paid but those kind of things you could go do a show and then get on the bus and do a show in another city in the next day or two and that's something that on an equity contract they don't they they, they space it out a little bit differently because oh, okay. um, they don't want people you know, they don't want people tired and they, they want to make sure you get rest and things like that. Okay. Um, but if there's a thriving professional community theater around um, that does pay, usually a stipend or something else, uh, sometimes it's better to be non-equity because if you have very little experience on your resume, you want to build up that experience. Mm -hmm. And the way to do that is in the non-equity world. Um, uh, but that doesn't mean you have to sacrifice, you know, creativity or your desire to want to join the union or anything like that. Um, going into New York, um, there's where all the big auditions are, and they're in Chicago and, and in the West Coast. Uh, many non-equity people you can get jobs just as easily as an equity person. It, it really makes no difference. There isn't doesn't mean that you are better just because you're in equity. Um, I know people who are in equity that don't even work because they can't find work because there's so many people vying for the same job. So uh, I always say build up your resume. Uh, if you are if you if you have no ties, if you're young, you're willing to to go out on a tour, or maybe you get a job in Texas for three months, or you get a job in Kansas for three months, four months, or or in Florida or Toronto or wherever. Uh, sometimes that's a good thing. You you, you meet people. Um, you meet people, you meet other young, you know, people just getting into the business who you never know. That person that you're bunking with or doing a show with could move on to become a choreographer uh, or a dance captain and uh, or a, an assistant director. And you see them at an audition three, four, five years later, they remember you, so they hire you. Um, so I think the that kind of experience is very important, going around, seeing the country, if, if that's what you want to do. Um, going to New York is tough right up right away. Um, you know, a lot of people who go to New York, uh, they, they work hard just to pay for their apartment mm -hmm. and they barely audition. And, uh, you know, that sometimes not, is not good. So, but there are ways to do it. Some people get very lucky in whatever theater community they grew up in and then they move on from there, from there. Some people go to the big cities and they get very lucky. Um, but, uh, uh, so, so you either the the other way to get your uh, to go back to the question the other, the way to get the equity card is you 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 get hired as a non equity in an equity performance and they they basically give you points. Oh, okay. Um, I, I'm not exactly sure how it works and it, and it might have changed because um, I actually never went through the program through that program. Um, I did a show and here in Philly and they needed a certain required amount of equity performers and I was hired as non-equity so they offered to make me equity and so I didn't have to go through the process and I just basically had to pay my dues you do have to pay dues um, for me they were over like a thousand dollars I don't know what they are now um, and that's your sort of like entry fee and then you pay uh, every six months you pay something like 50 bucks or something to to, oh, wow. to, to be in the union so uh and then from there, you have once you have your union card, you know you have it for life, unless you say you don't want to be in the union anymore. Mm -hmm. But uh, so that 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 that's kind of the the, the there's several ways to do it. Uh, but most people just do it by like I said, you get on a show, you work uh, up for some points. If they don't do that program anymore, uh, you you can you can just pay the the uh, initial fee and get into equity. But I, even that, I'm not sure if that's because it always changes you know, every couple of years. Mm -hmm. But I always say, you know, for younger people right out of college, you know, just wait a little bit. If, if, 
if it, if it's more important to get experience, I think it's better to do that. And, and, but make sure you get paid, you know, <laughs> you don't always have, you don't always want to work for free, yeah. you know? Yeah. So. Well, that's interesting. I, I, I did not know most of that. So I'm, I'm, thank you for that, for that information. Yeah, sure. And like I said, it's, I'm sure that is most, some of that information might even be a little out of date. So <laughs> there is an equity, uh, equity, actors, equity, uh, association, um, uh, website, so that uh, you know, I can certainly pass that on if she wants to do more research. And um, sometimes it's good to also just talk to other performers uh, mm-hmm. wherever you know, if you, if you meet them, just to sort of see how they did it. Yeah, and and that's the one thing I do like about uh, the program that she's in here is is that the uh, the instructors do have um, uh, connections, and they bring in actors, uh, especially ones that ha- just happen to live around this area. Um, I know Patty Duke has come in. Okay. And, and talked talked with the class. There's been uh, at least one or two more, you know, you know, pr- name actors that you know you would you would recognize, but I, I can't remember what who they are at the moment. But but they do bring them in and, and they uh, you know allow the students to ask all these questions. And and uh, my daughter, being the very curious one, um, tends to I think monopolize the conversation. But uh, but she she enjoys finding out about this stuff. And you know it's 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 also very new. And we live in such a we actually live in a very small community. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, it's, it's in Moscow in Idaho and, you know, it's just a small college town. Um, and you know, the, the nearest city is, is Spokane, which is about two, two hours away. Uh, and that's, you know, that's not even as big as Seattle or, you know, not, not nearly as big as the, you know, the, 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 the more well-known cities on the West coast. But, you know, so mm-hmm. we live in a very small community, but yet we have access to these kind of things. And, 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 uh, like I said, we're probably a little bit sheltered and she really wants to find more, find out more about this stuff. So. And I and I'm just interested too. Like I said before, I I I, I enjoy the theater and and kind of had a, a thing with it when I was younger. So, uh, okay. uh, if you don't mind, Peter, just one more thing about your your theater life, because uh, you you mentioned mm-hmm. you teaching at the university. Which university is that again? It's University of the Arts in Philadelphia. Okay. And uh, why did you take that job? Uh, it was actually brought to me um, from uh, the, the previous uh, instructor was leaving the school. So uh, I've known her for a number of years and she threw my name in. And it also is the university that I went to oh, okay. for college here and filled uh, for, for uh, musical theater for back when I was in school. Mm-hmm. And, I was wondering uh, about that. Yeah. And uh, I knew the director. I knew a lot of the instructors there. Uh, it, it was a good fit. Uh, I love the school. I get to stay in Philadelphia. It's right in Center City, uh, and it's a great school. It's one of the only universities that is truly devoted to to the to the arts. And um, I forget exactly what the uh, um, there there's sort of a special thing that they always say about the university. You know, I mean, there's certainly other colleges that offer up courses and 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 degrees and majors and in different theater um, different theater fields, but this is all. Uh, it was two colleges: colleges of the performing arts and college of the of art and design, which is uh, which is a huge part of the school. And the two of them together make up uh, University of the Arts. So it's a uh, you know typically four year programs in in a lot of various fields, such as music and dance and theater and music theater and directing and design and tons of art. I mean, the art side of it is just huge. Uh, film and animation and traditional art and illustration, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So um, it's an amazing school. You're in a thriving theater dis- town. You're not too far from, from New York. You're not too far from Baltimore, um, uh, Pittsburgh, you know, so it's, it's, it's a great school and it's uh, been building over the years um, into something that's uh, really churned out a lot of great talent. Um, there's a lot of people on Broadway, in TV, uh, commercials. Friends of mine that I even, you know, that I went to school with are fu- are really getting out there. So uh, it's a, it's a good school, and it's become a, a really great sort of like a training ground for a lot of the theaters around here. Especially they they see the University of the Arts name, and and they they know they're going to get a quality product. It's, especially if the person, the individual, is uh, aggressive and and wants it. Uh, then they will get it. Wow, sounds like I should have sent my daughter to that school. 
<laughs> well, I think it's great that there's a that there's a ma- you said you're a small school, a small town, but that there's a major for 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 musical theater out there. That's that's awesome. That's amazing. Yeah. Well, that's what we thought too. And 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 looking at because she'd looked at various programs around the country. Um, in fact, she may have she may have looked at uh, the one that you you mentioned, but I I don't I don't recall mm-hmm. specifically. Um, but it turned out once you know she you know she she did uh, you know the pros and cons for each one, and uh, she chose the local school one because it was close to close to home. She you know she's she she's a home girl, and mm-hmm. uh, you know likes to be around her family. Uh, which I, I would not argue with um, one bit when she was m- making these decisions, um, but uh, she she also looked at the program and at the time uh, there was there was a gentleman who basically ran the program and he was uh, you know he was a big advocate, uh, uh, you know, a huge part in helping us decide that this was the school for her. Uh, unfortunately, he left the next year, ah. so um, that was that was a big disappointment for, <clears throat> excuse me, for everybody. Um, but she's been continuing on and, and, uh, she's, she's grown quite a bit and, and, uh, she loves it. She just loves theater and, 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 and the music side of it too. And, um, we're, we're very pleased with the progress she's made, uh, you know, for, for, from our little school here in Idaho. But, um, uh, but, uh, to go back to the, to your, your teaching position, is that, is teaching something that you have done in the past or, um, or maybe not to the degree that you're doing now. And, you know, would you, do you like it? You, you must be enjoying it to some degree if you're still doing it. Oh yeah, absolutely. I've taught over the years, uh, you know, master classes and, and at, uh, academies and, and, you know, dance schools. Uh, I'm, I, I love passing on what I've learned because uh, I've learned from, from some really great, amazing instructors and some tap masters and things like that. So I, I enjoy passing on the, the history and the legacy and the environment is exactly where I want to be. This sort of electric, energetic environment, these, these, these young, you know, I can't call them kids, but the young <laughs> students. <laughs> um, well, they become kids the, the longer you do it. <laughs> yeah, they really do. Uh, you know, they're, they're going out into the world and they're doing, they're going, you know, into the stuff that I love, into the field that I love. So if I'm able to sort of help them in any way, you know, somebody, somebody said to me, well, aren't, isn't it like you're just training your competition? I'm like, yeah, sure. On some degree, but <laughs> you know, as long as I can still tap better than all of them, oh, that's right. better, then I, have no, I have no problem. Trust me. <laughs> but you know, it's, it's fun because I get to see them in practice and, and we get to talk about, you know, this whole crazy world and, uh, and it is a safe environment at that time. And, mm-hmm. and, you know, the, 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 it's it's good that they have people around them that uh, are in the field as as much as I am, or as little as I am, or whatever. And uh, uh, you know, I know people who have gone really far, and I know people who make a uh, incredible uh, job for themselves, a life for themselves, doing you know just doing shows here and there. You know, it's really what you want and what you make of it. Yes. Uh, you can be successful anyway. So. I try to make sure that they have a good perspective on it at all. Very good. Yeah, the, part of the reason I wanted to ask Peter was that um, uh, I used to I used to teach at the university here where I live, uh, but I, it, it was it was uh, essay writing. Cool. Um, but that was you know when I started doing that, and and I, I was going to grad school at the time, so I was actually a teaching assistant, but I was teaching my own courses, uh, doing that here, um, and I found that I, I loved it. I loved, as you said, you know, to pass along, you know, the stuff that I knew to the, to the, to this new generation. Mm-hmm. And, uh, it was, I, I basically had, you know, I, like I said, I said before, I kind of dabbled in theater and I actually got my, my degree in, in English, you know, you know, I took all the literature classes and the writing classes and, and I started writing that's fiction writing is, is kind of my creative, was my creative outlet. Um, nice. And and so when I got to grad school to pursue that, they offered me the, the teaching position, and I found that that actually was what I really enjoyed doing. And that that from then on, it, that was kind of my focus was, okay, I'm going to get this degree, and I'm going to get this experience, and I'm going to go teach because that's what I love to do now. Uh, right. Unfortunately, it didn't quite work out that way because the economy uh, went mm. bad, and uh, they basically um, – weren't hiring anymore. So <laughs> I actually had to go get another job to support my family. 
uh, and I'm still there after 14 years. So it's not teaching, but um, but it's paying the bills, and you know. Good. But so now I feel my creative outlet, uh, you know, doing the podcast. So there you go. <laughs> right. Yeah. There's always creativity going somewhere. For, I find people who who are creative or want to do creative things, you seem to always find it in some way. Mm-hmm. And the, and certainly in you know with the theater thing, the other the other good aspect about um, me in theaters, I'm not just sort of one of those. I, I don't always need to perform. I could be behind the scenes, you know, as well, directing choreography, whatever. Um, and, and certainly teaching adds to that. And, uh, there's, you know, corporate events and, um, there's tons of things you can do as a performer. Uh, it doesn't always have to be audition for a show, get a show, audition for a show, get a show, mm-hmm. you know, it can be quite a number of other things, you know? Um, so it's always good to stay open to a lot of what's out there. All right. Very good. Thank you uh, for indulging me in that conversation. Sure. Appreciate that. Um, no but we are, uh, we are, this is a comic book podcast, so I suppose we should probably move <laughs> on to some comic book talk. Okay. <laughs> uh, so let's, let's, let's move on to that. Um, Peter, you attended the, the Denver Comic Con, is that correct? That was last weekend I, or two weekends ago? Uh, yeah. Um, I think it was, last weekend right Uh, all my days are coming together Uh, it's like the 15th and 16th okay uh yeah last weekend so so how was that uh, it was great it was phenomenal denver comic-con apparently denver is in need of a a, a comic-con like this because they broke records um it was a two-day show saturday and sunday but they had a friday four-hour preview night and um and it's all, you know, they they had the usual Comic-Con things. They had an artist alley and, and a small contingency of retailers and, and other kind of craft work and, and geek-related things. They had uh, some TV and movie st- uh, stars there, um, you know, cosplayers galore in a really nice convention center uh, in downtown Denver. And it was amazing they it blew away their expectations uh i'm not sure if they've re- they've released um final numbers just yet but it's somewhere over the 22,000 mark wow um yeah they were they they had to basically uh they sold like something like 13 13,000 pre-order tickets and then all the rest were people at the door and um it was it was amazing and believe and i was there and i was taking pictures and it was crowded and a lot of the creators there the, from the from the smallest smallest of small press to the to the big big names said that they had a fantastic weekend and maybe some of the smaller artist alley didn't you know do maybe as well as they hoped but they certainly knew that the energy was there and the potential was there for a fantastic show um and uh, even someone like Katie Cook uh you know webcomic artist um uh and a, a official Star Wars artist and just an amazing person, amazing creator. You know, she, in the four hour preview on that Friday, she said she had, it was the best opening day she has ever had at any convention. Wow. And that was only four hours. So that's huge. You know, and Katie Cook is certainly well known, but she's, you know, she's, she's well known in the web comic cir- circuit and in some comics, but she's, you know, she's not a comic superstar just yet, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, in, in terms of the mainstream. So, but she has her following, right? And uh, I think anybody that was sort of very proactive about their material probably did very well at that show. And uh, the organizers, you know, uh, one of the co-organizers, Charlie from Indie Spinner Act, uh, Charlie LaGreca and his band out there, they put on an amazing show. It blew them out of the water. Um, I keep telling people, if you're going to go in 2013, especially if you're an artist and you want to set up, you know, try to get, get in early because I imagine they can only take a limited amount of people. Uh, and in 2013, you know, they announced that Stan Lee was going to be there, which Ooh, means tons wow. and even more people are going to be there, Yeah, you know? So no, fantastic show, fantastic convention. And I, I hope it continues on. So how would you, because uh, com- I've only been to the Emerald City Comic Con, you know, as far as big cons go. Um, right. Well, that's that's a big con to me. Um, <laughs> how would you compare the two? Well, Emerald is bigger. 
Emerald is certainly bigger and it certainly has a, a much large, larger guest list. Um, Emerald and Heroes Con, are, are, and, and I guess Baltimore Comic Con, they're sort of uh, comparable because they they get you know a really great guest list and it's all about the art and um, they have a, a good number of retailers there and they're in, in major cities. Um, Denver, size-wise, is a, you know certainly a little smaller, um, but the people were there. You know, I don't know what number Seattle pulls in, but apparently, like, they're saying that Denver Comic Con on the, on on the uh, for a first year show to pull in twenty two thousand people. Um, that's almost scratching at the door of the first C two E two and even the first New York Comic Con. Wow. So that's kind of big, you know. Those are especially New York. That's a New York's a you know huge city. Manhattan, huge city. I mean, they they probably should have gotten a lot more people at that first show, but they mm-hmm. had to, you know, they had problems, and it was a small convention space, and they they the fire marshal closed it down, you know, because there just was so many people. But in Denver, there's just nothing but room to grow, and um, that they're on par with those two other big conventions. That's huge. Wow. Uh, in in a, in a, in attendance you know, but now I think, you know, here's Denver, you know, kind of a little bit left of center of the country. Uh, you know, it's not certainly, it's not the middle of the country, but it's close to it. Mm -hmm. Um, now all these West coast artists, maybe they don't have to go all the way to the East coast to do a major convention. They now can go to Denver, you know, just jump over four States and boom, you're in a major convention with, with, that many people that are that have haven't seen you, you know, all they know is they know you from your comic work. They have they don't go to conventions. Where do you go in Denver? Maybe you go to Planet Comic Con in in, Saint, in Kansas, Kansas City. Maybe you go down to Texas. Chicago's really far. San Diego's really far. You know, you don't really have anything local that is huge. Mm-hmm. So now they're just hoping all these creators come to them. Well, it sounds like I should uh, maybe skip Emerald City, Emerald City one year and, and go to Denver. Yeah, you know, give it give it time to build. Um, but if you can wrap up a vacation in it and go into the mountains, you know, mm-hmm. I mean, you, you probably have enough mountains where you're at. <laughs> yeah, we do. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's certainly worth, I think, attending uh, at one point, you know, maybe give another year or two to see, make sure it keeps going. And yeah. then, uh, see, I didn't realize that that was the first year. Yep, this was the first year. They've had other sort of smaller shows, uh, you know, but nothing to this degree. And, and you know, they, the people came out. They really did came out for this. That's nice. So was there any, um, any, any news uh, coming out of the con from any publisher or, or, or creators that uh, you thought was interesting or if, that you wanted to pass along? They didn't have... Uh, publishers there just yet. I'm sure they they're gonna. I'm sure the publishers now will start taking a look at okay. this con. Um, and but they did have a heck of a lot of a lot of panels, um, and a lot of it was more spotlights on certain creators. Um, they did some TV stuff because, like I said, they had they had some voice animation actor uh, voice, yeah, voice actors there from a lot of animated uh, cartoons. They had some other, uh, you know, actors as well. Um, major news, major. I don't think anything sort of big came out. Um, I think just the fact that it went, the whole convention went off without a hitch was it almost trumped any other news that came out mm-hmm. from that con because everybody was so happy that it was so successful. Um, I've heard some things like from some creators that they're working on some stuff, but it, I think it's. I don't think it's anything that, <clears throat> excuse me, that's not already out there in the news. So. All right. Okay. Well, thank you for that. Um, sure. Let's let's move on to uh, I guess what I consider the the lightning round. Um, there, there's since I since I have you uh, on the show, Peter, I wanted to kind of uh, uh, pick your brain, get some general thoughts about some of these topics, and since okay. we'll, we'll be talking about. Um, the New Teen Titans games graphic novel, um, and you know we I I'm I'm a big DC guy. I know that you 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 are too. Um, these are these are mostly DC related, but uh, okay. I just wanted to throw these out there and just kind of get your thoughts on them, and then we'll we'll start talking about some uh, particular comics. 
Okay. Uh, first off, uh, I, I, and I know that you're, you're not caught up in a lot of these things, uh, but I just kind of want to get a sense of you know how you feel about this stuff. Okay. Um, so let's start off with the biggie, the, the new 52. Yeah, the new 52. Uh, uh, I think it's been a really interesting, what, 10 months now? Mm-hmm. Um, I think it's uh, it was a gamble and a risk that worked. <laughs> Big time. Yeah, um, you know, especially given given the the hindsight now, right? You know, um, listening to all the build up, even on the show, right? Some of those older episodes of uh, the build up towards last September, mm-hmm. and everybody's sort of expectation and wonder and their questions and and all this, and um, to see that it worked out as well as it did, um, there's certainly there's certainly a lot of the things that DC had said before they did the whole new 52 uh, is, is coming to pass. You know, this whole idea of if a title doesn't work, they're gone. If a creator doesn't work, we'll shuffle them around. Um, they're treating it m- as much of a business than ever before. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, the real, the corporate side of it, the, the, the scheduling, you know, there's probably only been a handful of books that actually didn't make their ship ship uh, deadline. Um, but if they were late, they were only late by like a week or something. Um, but the the majority, like 98% of their line is coming out every week, the same week, the same time in the month that they said it was going to come out. Um, they're building up some excitement. And, uh, you know, if ever you needed a more clear example that Marvel and DC are corporations, <laughs> are corporate comics, this is it. Whether you like it or not, this, you know, this is it. They, they are, to, to use a really bad phrase, they are making the trains run on time. And yeah. uh, mm-hmm. um, some people don't like that. They don't like the creative, they think it's a little bit of creative squashing. But I, I, and the other aspect of it that um, not everybody knows about and they're keeping hush hush about, but I, I have to imagine is actually playing a really big part is the, is the digital side of it. Mm-hmm. When they were, when they said they were going to release the books and the digital at the same time, that was huge. And I think it paid off for them in ways that we don't know. Mm-hmm. Uh, otherwise, why would they keep doing it? And, and it, I think the, the whole, the print and digital thing, um, I, I, I don't, remember reading a lot about that other than oh wow they're doing this but it's, that mm-hmm. seems like a really big publishing initiative that just right. kind of seemed to be glossed over or or yeah yeah they're doing that too kind of a thing at least that's my perspective on, on the things that i was reading at that time but yeah that's yeah to, to do that just the logistics of it uh yeah and they start they certainly weren't the first. I mean, they weren't oh, the sure. first to put out books. You know, we, you know, I'm not, I certainly don't want anybody to think that I think that that's what they were doing, but they did, they did put out their entire line and there were other publishers that did that as well. But this is, this is a major publisher that went around and, and could have, you know, retailers really could have revolted against this and, and they didn't. And, if anything, it there might be some evidence that it sort of helped print in a little bit, um, and now they're starting to do a lot of these digital exclusives that they then transfer to print. You mm-hmm. know, with the Batman Beyond Unlimited and Justice League Unlimited, and they're doing all new Batman stories exclusive to digital, right? For at least right now, right. Um, with Jeff Lemire and some other creators. So that's big. You know that they're paying attention to it and trying to make it work. Uh, the, you know, I'm certain, certainly they're being a little safe about it here and there when they can, but I can't begrudge them that because of the huge risk that they did take. Oh, last yeah. Year. yeah. Yeah, definitely. So what, uh, have you had a chance to read any of the second wave books that they, that have come out? Um, just, uh, flip through sort of earth Two. a lot of that is sitting in my, um, DCBS box <laughs> that I have to pick up. Uh, I always send my packages to my parents' house because uh-huh. I never know where I'm going to be in Philadelphia. And uh, so all of that stuff, which just came out in like the past month or two is I'm still waiting for. Oh, okay. uh, but uh, it's, it's interesting. And certainly now we have this new third wave now coming up in September. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, they're canceling a few books. They're starting up a new, a few other ones that are really, you know, I, I'm surprised at some of the choices they're doing. The sword and sorcery book with it, the amethyst. Revamp. Yeah. 
That one especially. Yeah, a new Phantom Stranger. Um, you know, these aren't safe titles. These are titles that they're probably thinking, well, if we can squeeze six months out of them, let's see if, see what we can do. Um, uh, so the it's interesting. You know, I, I haven't been able to second guess a lot of their their choices on some of this stuff. And, uh, you know, sure, some things didn't work and other things were, you know, uh, you know, probably doomed from the beginning. Um, but I have to say, on a whole, I think they what they did was was really really interesting and uh uh you know they more and more that i read from retailers um on newsarama one of my favorite online journalists is uh, vanita rogers and she took a look at all the re- retailers that she could get a hold of uh, i think this was in the ninth month and she wanted to see what was going on and wh- what they felt and you know, to a one even if they had some problems here and there they all said the same thing was that dc was making them money and that's all retailers care about. Right. So the ones that probably didn't make money were the ones that kind of maybe poo-pooed the whole initiative and underordered, or they weren't proactive enough. Um, or maybe they're just in an area that can no longer support them, you know. Um, but the ones that seem to f- seem to find success are the ones that really did stuff, you know, whether they offered those titles in bundles um, they were getting returnability on a lot of those comics. So, you know, they they took a chance and it paid off not only with their DC customers, but uh, apparently it, it it extended to other publishers uh, off the shelf. So, you know, as long as they're making money, I, I don't see this as a bad thing at all. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. So uh, speaking of making money, uh <laughs> What did you? Uh, what, what, were your, what are your thoughts on the whole before Watchmen situation? <laughs> a nice segue there. <laughs> um, yet another bundle of books that is waiting in my DCBS box. Um, uh, so, so there's, there's, I think there's a couple thoughts you can throw out there. Um, the first one being, um, if anybody ever had a problem with Paul Levitz, I certainly never did. Mm-hmm. Um, if you ever had a problem with Paul Levitz, well, then here's something, and and you do have a problem with Before Watchmen, what, Before Watchmen, well, then here's something you can thank Paul Levitz for, because I'm fairly certain that the only reason that DC hasn't done it before this is because of Paul Levitz. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, I think maybe he just felt that it just wasn't something that he wanted on his watch. Mm-hmm. Um, um, as a, you know, as a comic company putting out before Watchmen putting out these books i'm surprised it it did take them that long having said that about paul levitt you know mm-hmm. uh, certainly this is something they could have done at any point um i absolutely don't have any problems with it in terms of of them doing it um i don't think there's anything legally they're doing wrong doing wrong i actually don't even think there's anything morally they're doing wrong mm-hmm. um i've read a lot of articles and uh, I even read an interview with Alan Moore and Dave Gibbons, sort of, it was uh, right around the time Watchmen was already done, uh, so I, I want to say late 80s, and, uh, you know, there was some contract talk in there, and uh, uh, a lot of the wording that both he and Dave Gibbons said kind of made me go, yeah, see, when you say that, I can't fault DC for putting out these books 20 some years later, you know, or whenever, however long it's been, 30 years or whatever. Um, so I, I think it was a big uproar and, uh, I don't, I certainly can understand people's feelings and wanting to side with Alan Moore on the whole situation. Um, but on the other hand, I also see a lot of people reading it <laughs> Yeah. and, and I, I even know one or two, I won't out them until they say something, but I even know one or two, <laughs> one or two people who were really against the whole idea and whether they got the copies uh, whether they bought the copies, were handed the copies, or downloaded them, however they f- felt they wanted to re- read it, they did read it, and they offered quick thoughts about it, and they, you know, and they were done, and that's it. You know, they don't care anymore, and that's fine. You know, mm-hmm. they, but they read it. You know, so I, I, <laughs> I have to. Uh, some part of me says, well, you know, at least a little bit of uh, curiosity was there, and yeah. and really, for a business, that's really, I guess that's that's uh, uh that's what you got to do. You got to try to hook people in. 
Um, That's right. Yeah. From, from have you read them? I have read uh, only because I I get my comics. Um, so. I get my comics from two places. One is a comic book shop that's in Spokane, which is like I said before, is two hours away. So I go up there once a month and I and I get comics from them. But I also want to read a lot more stuff and you know, so I actually do get them from uh, DCB service oh, cool. as well. So, you know, I that's that's where I try out new things and, and read a lot right. more um, uh, smaller publisher stuff. And uh, so I decided that uh, the the before Watchmen stuff I would get from DCB service because they were doing at the time when they first started coming out, they were doing the bundles. And uh, so I, I got them from there, but I only get my comics from DCB service every two weeks. So I'm a little behind, but I have read. So that's a big preamble for this. I have read two uh, of the titles. I've read uh, the Minuteman one and Silk Spectre. Right. OK. And uh, I I enjoyed them quite a bit. Nice. You know, the, the art in both of them is fantastic. You know, Amanda Connor is doing Silk Spectre and Darwin Cook's doing Minuteman. And, you know, the stories, I, I'm enjoying the stories. Um, I, I, I'm not a, I'm not one of those guys that, uh, you know, thinks that 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 Watchmen is sac, uh, sacrosanct. And, mm-hmm. you know, we should never go back to that well. And, and, and you know, I, I, I understand that thought. And, and, you know, if it turns out that this, uh, the, 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 the prequel stuff is crap, then yeah, then you can, you, you know, hindsight says, well, yeah, they shouldn't have done that. But at the same time, you know, the, there's a lot of backstory involved in that, uh, that graphic novel that, that could be mined for additional stuff. And that's what comics are. You know, you, right. you tell these stories and you go back and retell these stories. And sometimes you go back and tell stories that were only hinted at previously. So, you know, I've been, I've been reading comics long enough to, to see that that's, that's what the companies do. And right. I'm okay with that. Right. Yeah. The, you know, the, one of the one of the comments I saw quite a lot was, you know, there's there's everything that you need to know about Watchmen is in Watchmen, and that's very true. Sure, mm-hmm. certainly for the story that Alan Moore was telling, yes, the all the stuff that's in Watchmen is there. But as you said, you know, take the character of Moloch. Moloch, for instance, you know, mm-hmm. he was he was um, what Dr. Manhattan's one of Dr. Manhattan's enemy. And, you know, OK, sure, there's there everything told for Watchmen is there. But that the but, you know, maybe they want to write a one of the adventures the, that actually uh, Dr. Manhattan went up against one of these characters or that the Minutemen did, obviously, because they put out the Minutemen, you know. So, you know, it's not I don't, I don't think it's necessarily that. Uh, they're trying to flesh out the Watchmen story. They're just trying to touch on the on the, on the universe of characters. Cause, right. Uh, and uh, yeah, you know, enough, it's not like Alan Moore and Dave Gibbons and all the rest created that because they wanted to create a new universe of superheroes. No, I get that. They they wanted to use it to tell a story to tell a story about comics more than anything. Mm-hmm. Um, so I get that it's a finite thing. It, it it's it's its own thing. Um, but you know. Even Tom Sawyer has a has a sequel, you know, even, <laughs> you know, even some of the greatest books we know, the greatest movies, they have sequels. And, yeah. and it's it's yes, sometimes it's a cash grab. And, you know, I, if I had a project that was made millions of dollars and, and somebody said, hey, you want to do a sequel? I probably would think really long and hard about it. <laughs> um, you know, I know. And, and see, now, having said that, everybody's going to go, yeah, but they didn't ask Alan Moore, blah, 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 blah. Which is technically not true because they did at one point way in, way in the past actually ask if he wanted to come back. But uh, uh, one of the things he said in the interview that that kind of speaks to me is you know, everybody always says about this contract that they had. And yet nobody has ever seen the contract um, between D.C. and 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 Alan Moore. And uh, it was a stipulation that, you know, if, if Watchmen would ever go out of print, it was supposed to go back to Alan Moore and Dave Gibbons after a year or something like that. Mm-hmm. And and that's certainly a, a a well-known thing in contracts, you know, um, it's the reason why uh, Dark Horse put out a collection of Major Bummer, which was by John Arcudi and um, Doug Monkey, uh, which was a DC book, but Dark Horse put it out because DC never did anything with the collection, so you know, eventually it reverted to the to the uh, creators and it went to Dark Horse. Same thing with um, Jimmy Palmiotti and Justin Gray's Monolith, mm-hmm. right? It was a DC book. Uh, they didn't, they didn't collect it, they didn't trade it. So now it's coming out through image, I think. So yes, there's certainly precedence for that. But in the interview I read, Alan Moore talked about, 
he didn't talk about trades. He didn't talk about collections. His wording was something of something like, you know, if what I, he says, what I, what I understand, if DC doesn't do anything with the characters, then they come back to us. Hmm. And that to me sounds very different than, you know, than, than just putting it in a collection, right? right? Or letting a collection go out of print. Because then David, Dave Gibbons follows up with, you know, uh, you know, certainly DC could do a sequel and, and I, I believe his words were even, and it certainly is within their rights to do so, um, but hopefully they wouldn't do it. Or if they did do it, they wouldn't do it without us or something like that. And that to me speaks far more than, that's just far more than trades. That means that they think that those characters are viable enough to do some more stories with. And if that's what DC is doing, and that is something that certainly Alan Moore and Dave Gibbons knew at the time, then I don't see why it's such a shock. You know, and I don't see why I don't see the moral, uh, the moral twist in it. Mm-hmm. So, those word that that wording is very powerful to me, and it's something I keep bringing up whenever I think read about you know this whole controversy. Well, and and related to that, you know, go back to what you said that Alan Moore said about the characters. Whenever I think about this, this whole kerfuffle about about before Watchmen. It's really interesting to me. You know, they talk about the, uh, some people talk about the like the ownership that that Gibbons and and Moore have mm-hmm. with mm-hmm. with before or with, with Watchmen, um, and yet these characters are uh, reimaginings of characters that DC actually owned, right. the, the Charlton characters. So, you know, how does that play into the whole? You know, if 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 indeed what Moore said is true. That somehow they the the, the 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 characters revert to them for ownership. How does that work when yeah. they're when they're you know to some degree derivative characters of an, uh, the company's characters? So I yeah I, you know Travis and I actually did a whole episode talking about um, uh, the the morality of contracts and you know all this stuff. Um, sure. You haven't got to that one. Uh, if you if you do, you can. <laughs> You can um, probably yell at us through the the, the, the headset, but um, but we we tried to talk through the whole thing, and I realized, you know, as we're talking through it, it's just it's such a you know us not being lawyers one and two, you know, not being privy to the actual contract. Mm-hmm. Um, it's really hard to talk about this stuff, but you know, we, we we gave it our best shot, but it was it was really well to me, it was a really interesting discussion because of the you know we both had um, somewhat differing viewpoints. Uh, right. So it was, it was and it, to me, that was kind of like a microcosm of, you know, the, the comic book community as a whole about this whole before Watchmen thing. So, sure. And, you know, I think what people forget is Alan Moore wasn't Alan Moore when he was doing Watchmen. You mm-hmm. know? I mean, maybe he was to the people who knew him from from the UK scene. And we certainly knew him from Swamp Thing and that he was a fan. He was a really good writer. But he wasn't Alan Moore like we know him today. Right. right. So, you know, when we talk about this whole contract thing and they wrap up this whole creator right thing and, and creativity and corporations, uh, you know, this is why people should self-publish and blah, 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 blah. You know, we also have to understand that DC, uh, he used DC to tell this story, right? Like this was his platform. Uh, he knew that he would get the distribution. He knew he would get, you know, the printing, right? You know, in, a, in an age where where there was no Kickstarter and when there was no self-published books to, to this degree as they are today. Right. So, I mean, he certainly understood what he was getting out of the contract. Oh yeah. Uh, He, you know, he was getting a company that was going to put the money into making this thing work and promotion and blah, 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 blah. So, I mean, there certainly was a trade and that's why the contract exists, right? It's not like DC just drummed up a contract and said, Hey, why don't you do something for us? Here's a contract, sign it, boom, done. And he went, okay, you know, no, I mean, there's, it, we're talking about Alan Moore, right? You know, he's a smart man. He's a smart individual. Mm-hmm. So, uh, you know, there's certainly, uh, and, and he even, you know, again, to bring up this interview, uh, which I'll have to send you a link so you can maybe post it or whatever. It, um, you know, he certainly knew that there was movie right possibilities and there certainly was, which I think people forget, there was merchandising going on. There was there was a watch that was made. There were buttons that were made. There were role playing games that they contributed to. You know mm-hmm. the original creators. Yes, a toaster is stupid. A Watchmen two toaster is stupid. Yes, I I get that. <laughs> but it's not the first time we've seen these characters 
uh, used to make money, I guess is what I'm trying yeah. to say. And um, to go back to that point where you said about, you know, using these other characters and then eventually he used the archetypes of them, you know, from this interview right now, he, um, he says, uh, we weren't asked to do anything with the Charlton superheroes. I just thought that they were all lying around up for grabs and I hadn't heard of anything else that was being done with them. They were just a nice, innocent little bunch of characters, which is always fair game, really. And there was a self-contained universe with four or five characters. And I thought it'd be nice to just take that and do whatever you wanted with it. Mm -hmm. So, you know, isn't that the same thing people are saying DC are doing? They're just using these characters for whatever they want and they're criticizing <laughs> them for that, you That's know? Right. Like, um, where's, uh, there's another quote here. Um, um, I don't know if I'm going to be able to find it where he, where he talks about, you know, if, if I had taken these characters, you know, make no bones about it, I would have, I would have butchered them. You know, they, they, I would have really put them through a ringer and had no shame about it. Too. So, I mean, it's like, he certainly knew, you know, I mean, it's like, it's not like these, we, I don't know, this whole painting of Alan Moore. Oh, here it is. Um, he's talking about Dick Giordano. He says, we were going to treat the question as a lot more extreme than he'd been treated before. Dick Giordano loved the stuff, but having a paternal affection for these characters from his time at Charlton, he really didn't want to give his babies to the butchers. And make no mistake about it, that's what it would have been. Hmm. I mean, this is Alan Moore saying this, you know, about characters that he just thought, like, as he says, were just lying around and that they're fair game. You know, I mean... Watchmen characters were basically lying around and were fair game. You know, I, I, I can't, you know, the internet doesn't lie. I mean, these are his words. <laughs> uh, I'm, I'm putting my own inflection on it, I'm sure. But um, I really can't fault anybody for this. I certainly can understand the outrage and, you know, people are getting up in arms. But I don't know. At that point, I say, why don't you just put your money, uh, mm -hmm. put, put your energy into something that you want people to read. And, and if you want to boycott DC for this, well, guess what? This is probably the eighth boycott they faced <laughs> over the past 10 years and i don't think they're gonna and it probably won't be the last yeah so. yeah definitely okay uh well let's <laughs> let's go to the next thing shall we sure um uh let's see here so i know okay so we one of the things we're gonna be talking about like i said earlier we're gonna be talking about new teen titans games um mm -hmm. uh but i want i was wondering if you wanted to make any comments about two things. So I know that uh, the, the whole DC Nation block on Cartoon Network, I know you haven't been watching uh, Green Lantern or Young Justice, um, uh, which, I, 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 Peter, I, at some point I, I would really love to see or hear your reactions to Young Justice, considering, you know, it's you know, it's basically the Teen Titans. Right. Um, redone uh, in a slightly different way. Um, right. And, and, and it's it's a it's a fantastic just it's my favorite uh animated series right now uh right. you know I, I love those characters i love what they've been doing with them so it's great so i can't wait to hear what you have to say about that um but uh there was some news recently uh about the the teen titans and so they they did uh they've been doing these these teen titans shorts during mm -hmm. the dc nation run um although and and it's it's featuring the characters from uh, the Teen Titans animated series from a few years ago, although they're drawn differently. Um, mm -hmm. I'm not sure what what style that is. It do they, do they refer to it as like a chibi style? Yeah. Is yeah. that right? Okay. Yeah, where they're sort of. I don't know if it's meant to be like they're just meant to be short, cute, emotional things. You yeah. And I, I don't know exactly what chibi is, but yeah, yeah. I, I know what you're talking about. So have you, you you've seen those shorts? Is that correct? Yeah, absolutely. They're what do, funny. What do you, say that again. They're they're. I, I think they're quite funny. Oh, okay. Quite humorous. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. They have a slight Looney Tunes feel about them. Oh yeah, there you go. I hadn't thought of that. Yeah. That's that's perfect to it. Yeah, and and uh, uh, they're a nice little throwback for people who you know finally remember that cartoon you know yeah. i did see i think one or two episodes of young justice when it first started um but i just purposely held off because uh, i was in the midst of watching other dcu animation um and and that is certainly you know poised well at that time when i saw those first two episodes i said this cartoon is gonna be fantastic and uh you know i know a lot of people 
Uh, at first, we're sort of hesitant about it because it it took over where Teen Titans Go left off, but mm-hmm. um, or where you know not uh, the regular Teen Titans show. Um, so, uh, you know, to hear that it's being it, that it's so successful and so deep and so amazing is awesome. I can't wait to get to it. Oh, yeah. And then this little these DC Nation shorts. And as much as I love the Titans characters, for me, one of the standout ones was are the Animal Man ones. Those are hysterical. <laughs> You know, those sort of feel like a little Ren and Stimpy-ish or, or, or mm. the tick, you know, not exactly the the content, but the way those cartoons were made or like the old uh, Bakshi Mighty Mouse cartoon that was really tongue in cheek. And um, they're hilarious. They're so funny. Uh, yeah, but I love I, I love the Titans one. Um I like the super best friends one. Oh, Those I love that one. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it's got Wonder Girl in it with a funky Amazonian accent. I love that. Yeah, isn't um, that great? That's a great interpretation of, of that character with yeah. having her speak like that. Yeah, and and you know, Supergirl's a little, you know, she's got a little chunk to her. You know, they're not all skinny <laughs> minis. Um, I think they're really fun, and and I I, I sort of put myself in kid mode and, and sort of think, what would I think of these if I was a kid? And I would have loved those, you know, like Saturday morning cartoons had the cartoons, but they always had those little things that ran in between. And uh, uh, what what fun. I can't wait that they put that. I hope they put them all out on a DVD because I would snatch that baby up right away. You, you mean put all the shorts on a DVD? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah you're right. I, I, I hope they do that too. And they're all over the internet. And I, I think some of it is, you know, you have to wonder, Okay, which are they trying to do them as like a test market thing? I don't even know how they would get feedback, but you know, maybe something pops up and they go, "Oh boy, we got a lot of response to that. Maybe we should develop that further." Um, in well, fact, go ahead. I think you're probably going to say what I'm going to say. No, yeah. you go ahead. You 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 were going that way too, so go ahead. Is they're making a Teen Titans Go cartoon? They're going to bring back the Teen Titans, and, and it's going to be called Teen Titans Go. Um, which is what the comic book based on the cartoon was, mm-hmm. um, which, you know, long since canceled. Um, and they're going to keep it in that same uh, uh, tone. You know, they're going to make it a comedy series and, and appear in the chibi form. Um, and uh, I, I think pretty much all the, the, the voice actors are coming back. And um, <laughs> it's, I think it sounds great. I can't wait to see it. <laughs> Well, it, it's, so you mentioned the the voice actors. That was one of the things that I I thought was just fabulous when they started doing the Teen Titans shorts. You know that they brought in the the voice cast from the the old Teen Titans cartoon. Yeah. That they were actually coming in and, and doing. I mean, because those shorts run what I don't know how many. It's got to be like thirty seconds or something, maybe a minute. Yeah, it's not long. You know, yeah. not very long. So it's, it's really quick work for these voice actors, and yet they were able to bring them all back and do these little things. But yeah, but yeah, the new now the new Teen Titans Go is coming. You know, I, I yeah. actually uh, I'm I'm actually not. I was when I watched the Teen Titans cartoon from a few years back. I, it took me a little bit to warm up to it because mm-hmm. uh, I didn't care for some of that uh, uh, manga influenced um, uh, bits that they did. Right. But over time, it's like, yeah, this is a great cartoon. And so, I, you know, I loved it. And it's kind of the same situation with the Teen Titans um, Go stuff that they have during DC Nation. It's like, really, that's 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 the interpretation you want to go with. But over time, I've 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 come to appreciate what they're doing. And and I'm looking now I'm looking forward to uh, what they're going to bring. Uh, is is it coming out next year? Did they announce when that was going to uh, be? Yeah. 2013. OK. Yeah. 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 So and, and so I'm hoping that you know they do this with Teen Titans now of course there's kind of a built-in audience to some degree for that based on the previous show but I'm hoping like you you know like you said with the Animal Man stuff and and maybe others you know how how they determine what is successful that will get you know an even bigger DC Nation block on Cartoon Network yeah and and the thing I liked about the that original Teen Titans cartoon um, you know I can sort of connect this connect it back to musical theater uh, And in musical theater, the whole idea, one of the ideas of one of the reasons why people break into song is is the idea is that words are no longer enough, right? Like the emotion is no longer enough to just say what you need to say. So you start to sing what you need to say. Mm. Um, And I think it's very evident if you ever watch, um, if you ever, if you've ever seen the movie Moulin Rouge Mm -hmm. with um, 
Nicole Kidman and uh, Ewan McGregor. Uh, the whole idea is that Ewan McGregor is supposed to be like a prodigy, right, with his music and his words. And he has that first scene with Nicole Kidman and, and she thinks he's a, a baron with money and he, he just thinks he's there to get money to do this production. And, and he gets so flustered by her because she's rolling around on the floor and she's trying to seduce him and blah, 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 blah. And he just starts breaking out into song. And it and it like stops her and it and then they go on you know with the song and um, the I sort of relate that to what they did in Teen Titans you know to heighten the emotionality of these characters and in some instances use like little shortcuts right like it's it's it wasn't enough to just have Robin be mad at Ch- a Beast Boy for something but he would get that little pulsing vein in his brain <laughs> on his forehead right yeah so. You no longer have to say anything. You could just show it. You know the, the visual interpretation, the visual sh- shortcut, which is very prominent in manga, certainly, um, is is amazing. And it's interesting. You know, I actually went back uh, when I was doing the tower over at CGS, uh, taking a look at a lot of these Titans issues. In one of the earliest issues, um, Changeling, uh, he's Beast Boy, but he's known as Changeling in those comics. Uh, he gets dropped on his butt. And in the next panel, he's rubbing it, talking to, to the other Titans. And George Perez drew a little wiggly line with a star coming off of Changeling's <laughs> butt, which is a very cartooning thing to do. Yeah. And it's obviously not something that he kept doing, right? But it's something that he did do at that time, just that little one-off. And it was like, oh, look at that. And that is that is exactly what the Teen Titans cartoon is. You know, it's, it's all those uh, cartooning tricks. You know, whether they're manga influenced or not, um, Dave Sim used them in Cerebus and comic strips use them all the time, you know, in Peanuts and all that other stuff. Um, in fact, we're, you know, uh, if we if we get time to go over what we're going to do in the second round, you know, that creator certainly used this cartooning stuff and a lot of the work that he did. So uh, I look at it as that it's 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 not only a style, but it also sort of to, to help younger kids right like they understand that they understand what a what what when somebody's mouth goes really wide because they're angry or their eyes get big because they're scared i mean that's funny to them and um so yeah i I think they use it to great effect on that show and and it became a show that was full of heart and full of references to the to the marv wolfman george perrin series um that i can't wait for more yeah, yeah. I, I you thank you for that because that you kind of put that in, in that whole interpretation of of the characters uh in the animated series now in a, in a different light for me. So that's cool. great. Cool. And okay, so and and yeah, like you said uh the I think the younger viewers connect to that really well. And case in point, um we have a couple of granddaughters that actually live with us uh right now and um they they watch that stuff with me every every weekend, and they love the the Teen Titans stuff because you know it's just it's just raucous humor. It's it's so much fun for them. Yeah. And 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 so so I you know I record them on the DVR, and then we we go and you know we watch Green Lantern and then we watch the Young Justice, um, and then usually what happens the way the DVR works, um, the the uh, the the short that goes in between the two. Uh, mm-hmm. usually gets cut off. I, ah. I, I miss like, you know, maybe 10 seconds of the short. And, and as we're watching it, you know, the, the first part, the Green Lantern hour, uh, we're watching that short and all of a sudden it cuts off at the end. And, and uh, one of my younger, the, the younger granddaughter that's sitting with me, is like, what happened? I want to see that. <laughs> I'm like, hold on, we'll see the rest of it. Just just give me a second. Right. <laughs> so yeah, it's 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 good stuff for young kids and and all the stuff they throw in, you know, for 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 us older viewers. It's that's yeah. that's how I feel about Young Justice too. They do the same thing, you know. They, they it's it's age appropriate and it, it transcends age groups to a certain degree. So I that's yeah. one good reason to love that show. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I'm looking forward to that. Um, and what else? Whatever else they come out with, I I hope they continue to have a lot of a lot of success with this dc nation block because it's been great stuff so far yeah absolutely they they know how to do animation right all right so let's uh just briefly peter and then because i know we we're, we're supposed to be talking about some particular comics here but uh <laughs> one more thing i want to get your thoughts on if you don't mind uh we'll, mm-hmm. we'll move from the small screen to the silver screen 
this time. Um, you saw Avengers, is that correct? I sure did. And what did you think of that movie? Uh, amazing. Um, one of the purest superhero movies, I think, on the screen. Um, uh, just some really, just really smart world building on the por- part of Marvel Studios um, from the five movies that led into it. Uh, to to the movie that it was, and uh, I, you know, I'm sure I'm I'm sure there were probably people that didn't see any of the other movies and saw the Avengers, but I also know a huge portion of people have been watching these movies since Iron Man, probably since Spider Man, but that's not included. Um, since Iron Man, and just loved it. I, I I sort of used my family as a benchmark, and from my youngest niece. Uh, who is uh, four or five, something like that, five, maybe even six, four, five, six, something like that, to, um, you know, some of my older brothers and sisters. Um, well, not, uh, younger than me, but older than my nieces and nephews, I should say. Um, there's a large age group there, and to a one, they all loved it. In fact, many of them saw it again, and... Uh, Loved all the parts that we as comic fans probably loved, mostly being the Hulk um, <laughs> and the Hulk, Iron Man and Thor. You know, they they were the standouts and uh, and Loki. Um, yeah, they fantastic, fantastic movie. Yeah, I, I, I thought so as well. Um, I actually, the, the two episodes ago, I, I had my friend Greg on and we talked about that for uh, about two hours. So we I, it was amazing. I, I wanted to talk about the movie of course and i thought well you know this it'll be a short show you know we'll both get on there and go uh did you like it yeah did you yeah and that was (laughs) but it turned there's there's so much to it and 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 so much you know for for us fans to to basically geek out on it um that we filled up two hours very quickly um talking about that so yeah it was it was great like you i think it's one of the the best superhero movies that's 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 been released so far yeah. Of course, we have a couple other uh, movies coming out very soon. Uh, I believe Spider-Man is next, and then followed mm-hmm. uh, very closely by The Dark Knight Rises. Mm-hmm. So, uh, which uh, which one of those are you looking forward to the most? It's hard to say. I'm I'm in a weird position where uh, initially, if you if it had you know if we were talking before Avengers came out, I honestly would have said that Avengers is the movie that I was looking forward to the most this year mm-hmm. because it was new in the sense that we've never had an Avengers movie before, certainly not new in that universe, but um, so I was really excited for that movie. And then, and then I probably would have said, you know, Dark Knight Rises is next and then Spider-Man after that. But the beauty of it is I don't have to choose because they're choosing it for me. (laughs) Avengers came first, Spider-Man will come next. And then after that, I'll be excited for Dark Knight. I I really can't, I can't, I can't pick one or the, uh, over the other because the more I see of this amazing Spider-Man movie, the more I think it's going to be like X-Men last um, uh, first class. I think it's, I think it's going to be a surprise hit. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, yes, you know, it's really close to the, the, you know, the having a reboot so close to the last movie, I get it, but I I don't know. I I think it looks really good. And I I love Emma Stone and um, yeah, yeah, I, I, I can't see anything wrong with it right now, especially because, Excuse me. Um, it's more or less created by the same studio and the same, you know, designers or whatever you want to call it. I mean, you know, yeah, no, Sam Raimi isn't there, and I'm sure his major people aren't there, but it's not totally removed from where those other Spider-Man movies were. And um, in my brain, I sort of connected the first Hulk movie to the second Incredible Hulk movie, you know, with you almost could look at those as a sequel to the other one in a, in a way. Um, I, I kind of wonder if, and and the same thing with X-Men first class, you know, even that was certainly uh, played on the first three movies. So I, I sort of wonder even with the new origin of this one, I, I, I kind of think I I wouldn't be surprised if you go in and you sort of go, Oh, it kind of does strangely fit into the same universe in a weird way, but you know, maybe not, maybe this one will be radically different, but I can't wait. And then dark Knight rises, forget about it. I mean, every time you see a trailer <laughs> pop up, 
everybody just in especially in a movie theater you know i I, i'm trying not to watch trailers i don't want to know anything about this movie i saw one trailer in front of the hunger games i know i'm sorry in front of avengers actually Mm -hmm. um and and that's all i want to see and it it made the audience just stop and just watch and i i think it's going to be big um you know I, i don't care if it if it's not as big as avengers because i don't think it needs to be it's its own movie you know and it's its own franchise and it'll get people people are getting excited about it um yes i'm sure it could let people down but i don't care it's i've been there for the journey so far i can't wait i cannot wait yeah yeah that's like you said before the beauty of this is that you know that my question was kind of a uh, misleading because it's not that we have to choose you know, right, there's there's sure. no ro- there's no wrong answer here. It's like we we get we're you know you talked earlier in the episode about living in the future. Um, I, I kind of think of that in terms of the superhero movies. I, I feel so fortunate to be living in a time where I get to see the Avengers on the big screen in the way right. that we did, and you know we get to see this interpretation of Batman in the Dark Knight movies, and you know this new Spider-Man coming out. It's like I I don't care how it fits in or should it fit in. You know, if, if it's rebooted or not, um, I just want to see a good superhero movie on the screen and and have, you know, the nation and the world join with me and, and celebrating this stuff. And then, right. you know, hopefully I don't know that, it you know, it doesn't it doesn't seem to quite go back to the source material. And, you know, it doesn't in other words, it doesn't bring the the movie girls don't necessarily come out of there going, wow, that was a really good movie. I want to read Spider-Man comics or, you know, or Batman comics it doesn't quite work out that way. But, you know, I keep hoping that eventually that may happen and, 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 you know, mm-hmm. bring more readers in and, you know, r- younger readers, older readers, doesn't matter, but, you know, bring the readers in and, 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 and build up that, that community that I belong to. I, that's, that's, that's my yeah. hope. And if, if the su- success of these movies, if some of the money funnels back to Marvel and DC to allow them to continue being publishing or, or at least allow them to be viable in their corporate master's eyes, then good, you know. If yeah. if if Warner Brothers or if Avengers has has made Disney go look, obviously Marvel has something going here. Let's keep putting you know funds in, or let's keep making them a, a company that we can get behind. Great, then that's the trade off I'll take, you know, because then that means the comics will still be made, and um, you know this material will get out there. Um, I think it's uh, you know I I think back now that you said that I think back when I was a kid, I, I'm sure. When I was watching the live-action Spider-Man TV show, I was also watching reruns of the crazy 60s Spider- Spider-Man show while also watching uh, Spider-Man and his amazing friends. You know, right there's three very different Spider-Men. And, um, mm. you know, as a kid, it didn't bother me. Uh, yeah. Certainly, you know, one was one, one was the other. So uh, I think... Um, as excited as I was about seeing Daredevil on, on one of those crazy Hulk movie TV movie shows. Um, <laughs> it seems like, it seems like we've always been around times where superheroes weren't far off for us to watch, whether it was a cartoon live action show, Lois and Clark, uh, mm, you know, true. a bad, yeah, a bad Nick Fury movie or whatever, <laughs> you know, like <laughs> they've always been there. Not to this degree, obviously not to this sort of, Attend, the way the media or the way the mass have sort of accepted them mm-hmm. um, probably not since the days of the Batman TV show um, or the first Batman movie um, but uh, it's I think it's great you know and it's only going to get better from here as they sort of get it right and get it wrong and uh, we'll see what happens we'll see where it goes I, I, I think it's great I I give every one of them a chance I don't care what it is you yeah. know I want to if it's bad, it's bad. If it's good, it's good. But I at least go and see it. That's right. Um, That's right. And and I usually end up dragging my family. Not dragging. They actually like to go to right. these things. So, yep. you know. Yeah, exactly. You said it perfectly, Peter. Yeah, okay. <laughs> All right. Well, I think maybe uh, speaking of, you know, bringing people into comics, maybe we should uh, – let's, let's talk actual comics now. Okay. And <laughs> – Move. Let's move on to. Uh, so we we're going to talk. So most of the stuff, most of the time, we've been talking about DC stuff. Um, but I want to take a little uh, side trip. Uh, you know, a little meandering over to the uh, independent realm, um, mm-hmm. mostly because um, you and I uh, are both reading this title, and it's so damn good. Um, and, and of course, I'm talking about Terry Moore's Rachel Rising. Yes. 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 He was actually when I talked earlier about. Um, 
you know, uh, cartoonists using a, a visual shorthand. He was mm-hmm. the artist that I was talking about. I didn't want to say his name just in case we ran out of time and didn't talk <laughs> about him. But um, yeah, Terry Moore, you know, who having talked to him on CGS uh, said that he wanted to be a cartoonist in the vein of That's right. Charles Schultz or something like that. Mm-hmm is a master of using visual shorthand. Now he's not using it on so much on Rachel rising, but certainly in uh, strangers in paradise he did. Um, so yeah, he's, he was the artist that I was referencing there that, yeah. that really knows how to use the medium, but uh, yes, Rachel rising. Oh yeah. This, I, you know, I, I read um, his strangers in paradise many years ago and then that's, and then I, you know, I uh, listening to CGS and listening to the interviews on there, you know, it's like, wow, this, this guy is just really cool. Uh, yeah. <laughs> and not you know he's a great creator, but he's also this really cool guy, um, based on those those interviews. And mm-hmm. uh, you know since then I've read um, Echo. Uh, I got the uh, the complete Echo uh, that came out cool. I don't know last year or so I think. And okay. I I started reading that one night and I and I devoured it. it I I stayed up until like two or three in the morning finishing that book because wow. I could not put it down. Nice. And, right. you know, it's a great story, but it's just, you know, it's mostly it's so it's 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 Terry Moore's storytelling technique and just his his beautiful art. I, I just I'm in love with this guy's art. Yeah. You know, having um, I sat down, you know, there's uh, eight issues of Rachel Rising out so far. Um, and. Uh, I read it all. I, I read like some of the first issue, like one or two, I think one, two or three of the first, you know early on as they were coming out. And then when you said you wanted to talk about, I was like, great. Okay. So I read it all at once, one through eight. And, um, it is, it's so interesting to, to come home again to, to his, his way of telling a story. Mm -hmm. And really, I think ultimately that's what attracts me much as what you said to his, to Terry Moore's work, um, is the way he decides to tell that story. Now I haven't read echo yet, but, I have to imagine it's sort of the same thing where, you know, you're introduced to these characters, you're introduced to whatever world they live in, whether it's the larger world of Strangers in Paradise or the small community in Rachel Rising. Um, you're introduced to the setup. You're given some questions. Some of them might be answered. Some of them might not be answered. Some of it may not even matter, right, because it's about the people, the characters, um, the world that they live in and, and the interesting things that happen to them. He always writes characters that lead. I know this sounds weird to say, cause you could say this about any, any sort of fiction, but they leave, they live very interesting lives, mm-hmm. right? They don't just have normal friends and, and people that are around them. They use, everybody always seems to have something more to them which keeps them very fictionalized, right? You know, the, one of the things that people used to say about Strangers in Paradise is that, oh, it's such a real, real story, such a slice of life story. And I, I always fought against that. In fact, I think <laughs> I think I always asked, I, I even asked Terry Moore that. I said, look, in the, one of the first times we meet Kachu, she wakes up, the alarm clock goes off, she wakes up and she shoots it. I don't know many normal people that do that. <laughs> and I, I, I think he purposely writes them not to be reflective of, who we are, but slightly, ref, maybe reflective, but then with a slight twist. And, yeah. and I like that. I appreciate that about his characters. Or, or more than a slight twist, depending on the character. But yeah. Well, yeah, very true. Very true. <laughs> yeah, you know, it's funny you bring that up about uh, about the slice of life thing, because that, you know, that's what I continually heard as well about Strangers in Paradise. But, you know, if you look at the overall story, that that's not really slice of life. There are, there are moments when it's very slice of life, but then you get right. into the whole um, the situation that Kachu her past and where she came mm-hmm. from and what she did, mm-hmm. and and how that keeps coming back throughout the whole run of the of the series. You know, because because Terry Moore would would bring that in, and there'd be some stuff going on as far as plot and 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 uh, setting and whatnot. And then he'd pull away from that and and have these very these these very intimate stories between Francie and Kachu, and then bring it back in, and then you find out more about right. David and and how that all ties into everything. It's just, it's I I would not I would not uh, call that entirely slice of life, but it right. but it certainly was entertaining. Yeah, yeah, and this and these issues here were, you know, it it felt very nice to come back to uh, another Terry Moore series, and and um, I 
certainly don't know what's going on. He hasn't given us given us quite enough just yet to maybe even speculate on on, on what's going on, other than sort of putting some things together. Um, but it's beautifully drawn, um, and uh, I'm already starting to feel for a lot of these characters, and uh, I'm glad that uh, sort of how my comic reading is going these days. I, I let thing I'm letting things pile up, and then I sit down and read a huge chunk of it. So mm-hmm. I'm sort of glad that you mentioned it about maybe a possibility for the show because then I was able to catch up on it. So what uh, what are some of the highlights of the, the series so far for you? Um, I th- Probably some of what I thought going into the book was going to happen or, or what the premise was certainly was, was very different. Mm-hmm. Uh, to get a little to get a little more specific, you know, I just from the title and from the early premise, I just thought it was uh, Terry Moore doing zombies, right? Like mm-hmm. I, I just figured that's, and maybe that's not far off from the truth. Um, and and then as it went on, even in the first couple issues, I thought maybe it's not zombies, maybe it's vampires. You now, um, then you go on some more and you start to learn a little history of the town and and the whole idea of the the history of the, the, the witches, it takes place in Massachusetts, right? And the, the whole um, history of the, the, the witches that were burned, or the women, I should say, that were burned because the, the town townspeople thought they were witches. A hundred women were slaughtered for witchcraft. Uh, and then you, then you start to go, okay, now I see what's going on. You know, all these women coming back to life and um, the one clue that Rachel says where she touches that one woman in the bathroom and says something very old is going to get into you. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you have to assume that the 100 women, whether they were witches or not, you have to assume that they are. Um, I assume they're coming back. And and something doesn't quite go right with Rachel in that term. You know, she comes back, but maybe not in the way that whoever that strange other woman is, maybe, maybe not in the way that was she was supposed to, you know, cause she still, still sort of has her, her will. Um, and, and the reason I say this is cause we meet a, another woman, that woman that she, Rachel meets in the bathroom and she sort of has this like power that she can see something. I don't know, uh, maybe their death or their lifeline or something like that. And she says, you're going to come back or, or you're going to have something very old come into you. Well, that woman actually does die and she comes back with this snake in her and these uh, powers. And yeah. Yeah, it's really kind of horrific. Uh, <laughs> and so you have to go, oh, is that is that how they come back? Because uh, there was that scene with Rachel in the bathroom where she coughs up what she thinks is a rope. And maybe it is. I, I thought it – maybe I, I maybe I'm speculating out of turn, but I thought, oh, was there a snake in her that just died? Maybe something about Rachel – doesn't allow the witch to take over or something like that. So I don't know. It's it's interesting. I don't know where, where it's all going to go. Yeah. Yeah. So one of the things I, I, so in preparation for this, I was doing some reading about, about the series cause I was curious, you know, why, why did Terry Moore want to do this? Um, and so one of the, one of the things I found, <clears throat> excuse me, one of the things I found was, um, so he, he, he compared this to echo, uh, in that he conceived echo as a movie you know, with a very distinct beginning, middle, and end, and, and that's it. You know, that he told the story, and that's it, and here it is in, in, in its form. But he sees Rachel Rising. One, he wanted to do it because uh, he's always been interested in horror, and this is his horror story. Hmm. And two, he, he thinks of this one, you know, I said before about uh, Echo being a movie, he thinks of Rachel Rising as a TV series with, with hmm. distinct, um, you know, uh, series arcs or themes that he'll continue to explore as the title goes on. Right. right. And so, yeah, uh, when I, when I first heard about this, of course it's Terry Moore is doing a new series. Well, yeah, I'm interested. But then, you know, when I found out, you know, the kind of the concept or saw some of the, the preview art, I kind of thought the same thing as you, you know, this is a, this is a zombie story of some sort. Um, Mm -hmm. And I, I figured the story would be about, well, what happened to this girl? And that would be it. You know, essentially, you know, if you distill it down right. to its 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 basic core, it's it's that. Well, that's we, we're going to get that, I'm sure. But he's he's developing these other characters and these situations, and the more we get introduced to, it's 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 such there's it can be so much broader, and he's developing in that that way. 
that I, I you know I cannot wait to see what what this actually you know it reminds me a little bit of uh, David Lynch's TV work. You know, where he's, with these odd characters in this odd little town, and these odd things that keep happening, and you know, it's, it, and there's, but there are there are these, there's these um, uh, forces from beyond at work, mm-hmm. as well. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, yeah, this this is such good stuff. You, you mentioned that the snake with the and the woman, and 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 there's all these other little things too. You know, that well, just the characters themselves. You have Aunt Johnny, which is an interesting character. Um, uh, the 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 young girl Zoe. Right. That that's that's appeared and and seems to be under the influence of that mysterious woman, uh, at least mm-hmm. to some degree, you know. And and uh, uh, the, the doctor, um, the one doctor that they take Rachel to, and you know, we find out about what's going on with his wife. You know, that's <laughs> just creepy stuff. Uh, uh, Creep, the, creepy stuff that that kind of reminded me. It, it felt like a little bit of a flare from Garcenis's preacher that moment where Dr. Seidman goes home and oh, yeah. you, learn, you learn about his wife. I was like, damn, this is like right out of Preacher. <laughs> this, is, this is awesome. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, let's see. Oh, the, you have that, that, that elevator scene uh, in issue five with mm-hmm. Zoe and that, that one guy. You know, it's, wow. I, this, to, to go from Strangers of Paradise to Echo to this, like all these, these the horror, the kind of like the horror tropes that you, you see in, uh, right. on movies and stuff to be, to be interpreted by more in this way, you know? Yeah. And it's interesting that, you know, the, the, what you say about him wanting to touch into horror and, and, um, as I was reading it, a lot of the, a few of the male characters that were introduced to, you know, they all sort of had these creepy undertones to them and, and you, you, you sort of realize or, or, or Terry, introduces what those creepy things are, right? Whether it's the foster father that uh, the young girl Zoe is going to be put in, uh, the, the family that she's going to be put, it, be put into, and the father's, you know, basically a pedophile probably. Mm-hmm. Um, and then, uh, uh, you know, Dr. Seidman, as you said, with his wife. And, you know, it, it makes me go back and at first I was sort of going, boy, why, why, why are all the male characters, why do they all have these sort of like faults or these crazy things but then I go. Then I realize. Well, no, it's every character. Every character has something about them, and that's because, as you said, this is Terry Moore's horror story. And in a horror movie or TV series, everybody pretty much has something that is going to relate to the horror genre on some in- instance, right? Mm-hmm. And you can sort of track that back to Strangers in Paradise, where everybody always seemed to have a secret. Everybody always had some emotional, uh, emotional, romantic entanglement, um, uh, you know, and, and that's just part of Terry Moore's fiction. Like that's what he enjoys. He enjoys setting up a genre and then using the characters to explore every single part of that genre. Mm-hmm. And, uh, once I got that, you know, then I was like, Oh, okay. It's not that he's just trying to show that men are bad or whatever, you know, it's just, that's every character has something in them that is evil, something that is rising in them. If you want to use part of the title, you know, which makes me then go, you know, who's the guy that's watching over jet um, Ernie or Earl. Earl or whatever. His, yeah. Yeah. I'm like, Oh, I don't know if I should trust him either. <laughs> well, and, and, and I'm glad you mentioned that because that was one of the things this, so this is issue seven uh, though that, that, that it struck me because, you know, when, when, because you, you you see Earl and he's he's in the morgue with with Jet, mm-hmm. and he's he, he he's, you know he's there to take care of her, um, and there's this moment where he he kind of stops and then he turns and locks the door and you start thinking oh no mm-hmm. you know mm-hmm. but but then you know Moore turns that around and uh, completely subverts that that moment by you know this guy professing his love to this now dead girl. Right. And then in the next issue, um, Jet's now awake, but, you know, at one, some point in the, the issue, I think it's in the later part of the issue, uh, it's just uh, her and Earl again. And he, basically Jet uh, implores Earl to hold her hand because his touch is the only thing that she can feel. Everybody right. else touching her, that she can't feel him. It's him. And I think that's a great uh, juxtaposition to the rest of the, the male characters so far that we've, that we've seen in this series. 
and yeah. and, I, and I really hope that we you know Earl doesn't turn out to be you know bad because <laughs> I, I like that yeah. I like that that kind of shining moment that or that that uh, that glimpse of hope in 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 a character not necessarily that it's a male character but you know a, a character in this story so far right yeah and it's a good it's it's a great point you bring up about that scene because it, it it is really sort of powerful in its own little way and it uh sort of speaks to whole terry moore's whole thing about uh, you know people are just people and you know what people get together because of the strangest reasons or have a connection i should say mm-hmm. because sometimes sometimes the people that you don't think are connected are connected in a small way and uh i i just like the questions that are being brought up and um you know, like Aunt Johnny, right? First, her her name is Johnny. We 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 hear the name Johnny first, and then, and then Rachel says Aunt Johnny, and you know, Terry Moore certainly has dealt with lesbian characters before, but then it made me even think even further. You know, okay, is it a lesbian character or is it a man that is now a woman? You know, mm-hmm. is he going is he going into transgender territory here? Um, you know, we don't know. I don't know. I mean, she seems like she's a woman, but. Aunt Johnny and John, I guess Johnny could be a, 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 a nickname for a woman, you know, for, but I don't know. It was just interesting. Just like sort of these questions that he brings up and he, he likes to take chances and explore different things. And I, I think that would be a great exploration if he's going that way. I'm mm-hmm. not sure. Well, there was, there was a one scene after the accident where Rachel is talking to Aunt Johnny and they do, they do discuss, uh, I can't remember the, uh, the name of the character, but, but someone from Aunt Johnny's past. Oh. Yeah, and, and you know, and it's 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 a woman, so um, I, I'm sure we'll see more of that. But yeah, it's you bring up a good point about about the 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 avenues of exploration that Terry Moore likes to throw into his work. It, you know, it right. just makes it makes his his stories that much richer to me. Yeah, and he's he and he still, I have to say, some of it felt a little straightforward in the art. Um, uh, beautiful Terry Moore art. You know, if you, if you know Terry Moore, you know to what to expect. Uh, if you don't know Terry Moore, you know, maybe you might think it's a, it's a little too clean or, uh, or whatever, but there, then he hits you with some really great things. And, um, like the one where Rachel falls off the roof and slams into the car and it's a great destruction of the car scene. Um, the accident that they get into and that, that moment where Jet, before we realize she's going to come to life, come back to life a few pages later, you know, she, she's looking at, at Rachel and she, her body's all twisted. And Jet says, uh, you know, why, why is there no one here? Why yeah. is there no one here waiting for me? And you're just uh, like, ah, oh. yeah. it's just so that one hit, that hit me the strongest out of anything so far. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, great little more. And then in, and in, in contrary uh, or contrast to that, the, the scene where Jet comes to Rachel to, to talk to her outside in the snow and or in the cold and and she she holds up her pinky and says you know, <laughs> she because Rachel doesn't want to talk so Jet op- holds up her pinky and the whole we get we get this flashback of when they were teens and and that they will always be together through thick and thin through life death and the afterlife and um, there's a beautiful shot of Rachel when she she first sees the pinky then she turns away. And then she comes back again and she, she's sort of leaning on her hand and she has this defeated smirk on her face. And it's a beautiful, subtle character shot um, that Terry does so, so well. Mm -hmm. Uh, His body language is so amazing. What, what seems like it's very straightforward at first, you start to see little twists in the body, little facial expressions, reaction shots i mean he's just he really has honed his craft i mean it's just an amazing work yeah yeah definitely have peter have you picked up any of his um uh, i i guess art books oh the how uh terry moore how-to books that are coming mm-hmm. out no i haven't picked them up yet uh they're um, uh, but they're definitely on my list of okay. books that I, I want to get I, I did actually order and and i have uh i got the hot girls cold feet one Mm-hmm. Um, just, just to get a sense of the, oh, I think he was, he had it on sale or something, but, um, but you go through that and just to see the, the strength of the art, the, the simplicity. And yet, yet you have the, there's, there's so much going on in it. It's, it's just amazing. And yeah. so now, now I want to go back and, and pick up all those, his, how to draw stuff. Um, mm-hmm. not because, you know, I, I, I 
can draw. I, I, I'm really not that artistic, but just to see the the guy showing his craft is I I, I, I really want to see that stuff. Nice. All right. Uh, anything else you want to mention about uh, Rachel Rising or, or Terry Moore? Um. Well, you, uh, I know if people are interested, you can get them digitally. He is putting the books out digitally That's right. as, mm-hmm. as long as print. There is a trade of the first six issues out so far. Uh, it's um, it, isn't it? It's solicited in this month's previews, isn't it? The oh, trade? is it? Okay, yeah, I, I think I so. I thought it had already come out. Okay. It may have. I I don't know. Um, but I I remember I did, I did see it in solicited in this month's previews. It might have be a re solicit, but either way. Yeah, people should definitely check it out because um, I know I had a hard time. I originally was going to get this in trade, mm-hmm. and um, I don't remember what prompted me. I think I just – oh, I, I know what it was. I finished Echo. I had I had just finished that in that marathon read that one night. I'm like, I need I need to read Retro Rising now. <laughs> I need more. I need more Terry. I need more Terry Moore. That's right. And, and I think at that time, issue – three had come out I, I'm, I'm trying to place the timeline now but um so i i know i had pre-ordered issue four and then i was trying to go back and find issues one two and three um and i had a hard time uh because i you know it's, i don't think a lot of comic book shops well, at least the one i i go to you know they, they had a few issues but they didn't have all of them right and uh so i, I actually ended up ordering i think two copies of the comic directly from Terry Moore's site, so I ordered ordered cool. that and and got the the collect the uh, Hot Girls Cold Feet publication as well. So um, yeah, I couldn't wait. I had to go get that, and, and I and I'm I'm so glad I'm getting it now monthly, uh, and I can't wait to see what comes next. Yeah, it's it's a hard book to read monthly because um, it's it's slowly building, um, but it's I think it's worth it, the attention and. Terry Moore goes to a lot of conventions, so you can always find the work there. Uh, and uh, if you need, if you're a fan of Strangers in Paradise, uh, but maybe you haven't touched Echo or this one yet, um, you know he's he's very open about saying that all these three books exist in the same universe. I mean, oh, it, it does. They're yeah. I mean, I know. You know, he says they're part of the Terry universe. So, okay. um, so well, much I, so that I, I go ahead. I, I knew that he had he had placed uh, some Strangers in Paradise characters in Echo, but I didn't realize that Rachel Rising was also part of that. Yeah, yeah. He uh, read an interview where he said, you know, not that not that he's saying this will happen, but he said, you know, it's very. He says it wouldn't be surprising if uh, you saw some characters roll through Massachusetts, uh, <laughs> you know, roll through Manson, Massachusetts. Uh, and of course, next year being 2013, the 20th anniversary of Strangers in Paradise, he also mentioned that uh, Kuchu and Francine are coming back in some way in some new story. Yeah, so, I, I, I read that too. Yeah, can't wait for that. Yes, exactly. Yeah, what could that what could what could that possibly mean? I, I have no idea, but knowing Terry <laughs> Moore, it'll be fun and creative, and uh, I certainly will pick it up. Yeah, most definitely. All right. Uh, well, Peter, shall we continue on? Yeah, let's do it. All right, let's let's go to the next one. Uh, it's probably one of your longest episodes. <laughs> <laughs> do Do you need to go? No, 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 okay. not at all. All right. I, I, I just wanna... say I was just saying it's just it. Uh, but no, you've had two hour episodes before. Yeah, yeah. You know, it's yeah. really funny, Peter. Um, I'll probably cut this part out, but <laughs> um, it being a a, a listener of podcasts. Um, I always hated the really long ones, like two hour plus long ones. <laughs> and then I start doing it and I realize, oh my gosh, that's why they're two hours. Cause you know, you start getting into this stuff and you just keep talking. Yeah. It's very easy to, oh to, my to gosh. show it. Yeah. So I'm, I'm a little more forgiving of, of, uh, episodes that are longer than an hour. <laughs> well, here, this is the, this is the way I, I look at it and, you know, keep it in. I think you could you know, keep all this in. It's great. Um, <laughs> the, when people used to like when CGS went five days a week, um, people were like, "Oh my God, I can't listen to it." Blah blah blah. The majority, you know, how many people work an eight-hour day and just sit at a desk and can can listen to? In fact, two hours is too short for them, right? Like they <laughs> they're like, "Oh man, I got another six hours I got to fill." Yeah. I mean, it, believe me, we had a lot of people come up to us and say, "No, 
I'm glad you went five days a week and keep them as long as you want because I have nothing else to listen to all day. <laughs> so the, the people that couldn't listen are ones that want to listen. They just don't have the time, which is fine. You know, that's why the episodes were always different. You know, you, you pick and choose which one you want to listen to. And then if you have time, you go back and listen to it. You know, it's not like these things go away. Um, but uh, no, so I, I think longer episodes, uh, shorter episodes, whatever, do whatever, you, you know, whatever you think works. <laughs> All right. And that's part one of my conversation with Peter. Be sure to listen to the next episode where we discuss New Teen Titans games as well as what Peter is going to be doing next. So come back and listen to that. Thanks for listening. <laughs>